Welcome everyone. I am Stephanie Plunkett, Deputy Director and Chief Curator at the Norman Rockwell Museum and my colleague Robin Phillips Pendleton uh, and I and all of us at the Norman Rockwell Museum are so pleased that you've joined us for the series of compelling conversations with accomplished illustrators, art directors and scholars exploring the history of racial representation in published art and the role of mass circulated imagery as a force in shaping public perception about people and identity. Presented in conjunction with Imprinted Illustrating Race, the museum's current exhibition, we hope these discussions will spark dialogue and renewed consideration of the ways that art advertising and systems of publishing have helped to frame public opinion and how the art of illustration is a force for change today. To redress centuries of structural inequity and historical prejudice as reflected in imprinted illustrating race, the museum commits to being a learning organization and to deconstructing and reconstructing a just and equitable representative visual narrative for America through the art of illustration. Since its inception in 1969, the museum has explored the impact of published images and their ability to shape and reflect our world. Dedication to a deepened understanding of the art of illustration has led to the formation of the Rockwell Center for American Visual Studies, a research institute supporting sustained scholarship relating to published imagery and the emerging field of illustration studies through fellowships, symposia, and an ever-growing illustration history website accessed at illustrationhistory.org. We look forward to a wonderful program and to your participation in discussion both this evening and tomorrow. I'll just mention that the presentations may include negative depictions of people and cultures that are offensive and difficult to view. By sharing these works, we acknowledge that these harmful uh, we acknowledge the harmful impact that they have and seek to encourage learning, justice, and agency for all. Thank you for placing your comments and questions for our speakers in the Q&A rather than the chat so that we may bring them forward uh, as we go. Uh, there'll be a portion at the end of the program this evening where we will uh, bring your questions forward. Much appreciation to all of our commentators and participants and to my colleagues, Rich Bradway and Ellen Gorman, who are working behind the scenes to ensure that all runs smoothly. And I'd also like to say that this symposium is generously funded with support from the Terra Foundation for American Art. It's now a great pleasure to introduce Robin Phillips Pendleton, my exhibition co-curator, whose foundational research established the basis for imprinted illustrating race. She'll offer introductory comments in relation to the exhibition uh, and some of the things that uh, are outcomes of her learning and all of our learning. Uh, and um, this will be followed by Hidden in Plain Sight, a stimulating panel discussion about illustrated ceramics and American identity. Robin Phillips Pendleton is professor in the Department of Art and Design at the University of Delaware, Delaware, Newark. She's also interim director of the Graduate Illustration Practice Program at MICA in Baltimore. Robin is also a practicing illustrator and designer who has exhibited her work widely, and she's an artist for the United States Air Force, Air Force Artist Program a member of the Norman Rockwell Museum National Advisory Board for our Four Freedoms Traveling Exhibition, uh, which uh, traveled internationally. She's also a member of the Board of Directors of the New York Society of Illustrator, and I'm pleased to say that she's just joined the board of the Norman Rockwell Museum. Her essay, Race, Perception, and Responsibility in Illustration, appears in A Companion to Illustration, and Homework for Breakfast is her most recent illustrated picture book. Thank you again for joining us and welcome, Robin. Thank you so much, Stephanie, and to everyone, good evening. On May 12th, 2022, the 1976 painting, The Sugar Shack by Ernie Barnes, a professional football player and artist illustrator was auctioned at Christie's in New York City 
to Bill Perkins for just under $15.3 million. The auction just took over 10 minutes of bidding by up to 22 bidders. The price for the Sugar Shack far exceeded the previous record for a Barnes painting. The estimated sale price was $150,000 to $200,000. In November, 2021, Christie sold the 1978 Barnes painting Ballroom Soul for $550,000. The price of the Sugar Shack was more than paintings by Paul Cezanne, William de Kooning, and Claude Monet during the same auction. Barnes passed away in 2009 at the age of 70. The same Christie's, the well-respected British auction house founded in 1766. Their New York house listed the top 10 names to, co to collect in their That's America, a collector's guide to American illustrators, collecting guide in May of 2020. In May of 2020, omitted all illustrators of color and only listed one female. Christie's American art specialist, Paige Kesterman, noted the illustrators listed reflected a certain kind of American morality and one that was, quote, based on freedom, tolerance, democracy, and common decency, end quote. According to Christie's standards, these illustrators, mainly of the golden age of illustration, defined American values. The golden age of illustration occurred from the 1880s through the 1930s. Black illustrators weren't mentioned in mainstream culture. White Americans and illustrators largely ignored the image of black and brown people and their lifestyle during this time. However, fine art created out of the Harlem Renaissance and new Negro movements in New York City produced imagery for blacks by blacks at the same time as the golden age of illustration. The movements came out of the Great Migration, an exodus of nearly 500,000 Blacks who moved from Southern Jim Crow states and the Caribbean to the Northern cities such as New York City, Chicago, Detroit, Baltimore, and Philadelphia to escape unbearable and dangerous conditions of racism during the late 1800s and early 1900s. Aaron Douglas, an artist, illustrator, and other artists such as Gwendolyn Bennett of the Harlem Renaissance period worked to combat the omission and harmful misrepresentation of Black people and imagery through various media outlets. As a result, a positive Black image was widely distributed in the North. Still, its distribution remained scarce or obsolete in the South, creating two contrasting cultural narratives with remnants remaining today. The relationship between illustration and race in the United States began centuries ago with the visual narrative of enslaved Africans and Native Americans. This composite nine historical sketches depicts Blacks from the time of freedom in Africa through various conditions of enslavement. Also seven emblematic illustrations representing the conflict of liberty with slavery fought by the Anti-Slavery Society since its foundation in 1831. And here you'll see where images were used dually by uh, pro-slavery uh, printers and anti-slavery printers. They use the same uh, printed imagery. Illustrators help drive people from the East Coast to settle the Western areas of the United States by creating negative images of Native Americans and portraying them as vicious people in battles like this, regularly depicted in Harper's Weekly and Frank Leslie's newspaper. Following the American Civil War, from 1865, the assassination of President Lincoln, in April of 1865, the Reconstruction era lasted from 1865 to 1877. 
it was supposed to be a period of rebuilding in the United States that played a crucial role in the history of civil rights and racial equality in America. During this tumultuous time, the U.S. government attempted to deal with the reintegration of the 11 Southern states that had succeeded from the Union, along with 4 million newly freed enslaved people. In addition, during the time Blacks were able to vote and hold office. And you'll see that here, uh, where imagery was also just very straightforward um, in, in portraits of uh, the legislators. Reconstruction broke down shortly after the assassination of Abraham Lincoln in 1865. The illustrated imagery of Blacks, Native Americans, and Asians turned into derogatory propaganda through various media outlets, mainly through newspaper media and advertising trade cards and product illustrations. Most images used the nostalgia of the plantation South. These were popular outlets for this imagery because they had the wide, widest circulation. Thomas Nast, Joseph Becker, and others who previously illustrated figures in more normal scenarios changed their style of imagery. The more derogatory the imagery, the more newspapers, periodicals, and products were sold. The saturation was a part of everyday life. The power and influence at that time belonged to art directors, editors, printers, and illustrators, and were a mainstay for brands well into the late 20th and 21st centuries. The most famous example of illustration and advertising was a, paint, was a painting of Nancy Green by A.B. Frost for Aunt Jemima's Pancake Mix. This painting is on loan to our imprinted exhibition, uh, imprinted illustrating race exhibition. Just ahead of its 100th anniversary, Land Lakes retired Mia in 2020, the indigenous woman who once featured prominently on its, in its iconic logo from all packaging. Painted by Brown and Bigelow illustrator, Arthur C. Hansen, Mia first appeared on labels in 1921, kneeling in a stereotypical dress, holding a Land Lakes container. The logo was repainted in the 1950s by a Native American artist, Patrick DeJarlet. Native people are not mascots or logos. Lieutenant Governor Peggy Flanagan of, Ma of Minnesota is quoted as saying, she's only the second Native American woman to hold an elected post of a statewide executive office. However, the removal of Mia from Land Lakes packaging still draws criticism as does the removal of Aunt Jemima and others. Several subservient representational themes permeated our cultural landscape for many reasons. Norman Rockwell's depictions of Blacks on the Saturday evening post covers was a practice made famous first by J.C. Leindecker and continued at the post until Rockwell's departure. You can see how the painting of the train porter is on par with the image of Uncle Ben, both created in, four, in uh, excuse me, 1946. Rockwell was fed up with his editor's demands that all Blacks and Native Americans on the cover only appeared in subservient positions to whites. So he ended his contract to illustrate for Look Magazine. He created The Problem We All Live With, published as a two-page spread on January 14th, 1964. At Ruby Bridge's suggestion, Barack Obama had the painting installed in the White House outside of the Oval Office during his presidency. There are so many powerful examples of the influence of adaptations of illustrations throughout history. One of the most famous was the original illustrations 
of Uncle Tom's Cabin novel by Harriet Beecher Stowe. It was the best-selling novel of the 19th century here and in Britain. Stowe commissioned Hammett Billings to create six original illustrations for the authorized novel in 1852. Because there was no copyright, the story was adapted and transmediated globally over two centuries. Ava reading to Uncle Tom in the Arbor was the most famous of the illustrated scenes. Illustrators translated Uncle Tom into an older black man, promoted by the un uncomfortable familiarity of Ava's close proximity to Uncle Tom and his middle age. As a result, he became a less threatening visual character. The novel and several characters were influential in numerous posters, advertisements, animations, film, and ephemera. Products with this image are still being sold today. As a visual storyteller and illustration educator, my journey in researching the origins of race and illustration perception in society and culture began in 2014. It became the foundation for imprinted illustrating race exhibition. Questions of representation brought up childhood memories. As I searched for representations in illustration imagery that looked like me at that time. In 1974, the painting on the left appeared in the sitcom Good Times as the long pan shot with the closing credits. I never knew who painted it, but it was the first time I saw a black family portrait depicted on a public platform. In the fifth and sixth seasons between 1977 in 1979, the Sugar Shack painting by Ernie Barnes replaced Evans' family portrait at the end credits of the groundbreaking 1970s CBS sitcom, Good Times, which centered on a black family in Chicago housing projects with an artist named JJ, played by Jimmy Walker. It was the first time a black married couple was shown on TV. I was mesmerized as a nine-year-old because I was a budding artist who took painting lessons on Saturday mornings. I wanted to be J.J. Walker. In his Times interview, Bill Perkins, who bought Sugar Shack, recalled how much of an impact Barnes' work had on him growing up. You never saw paintings of Black people by Black artists, Perkins said. This introduced not just me, but all America to Barnes's work. It's the only artwork that has ever done that. Barnes painted the Sugar Shack after reflecting upon his childhood during which he was not able to go to a dance. Barnes said in, 2008, in a 2008 interview, the Sugar Shack is a recall of a childhood experience. It was the first time my innocence met with the sins of dance. The painting transmits rhythm, so the experience is recreated in the person viewing it. To show that African-Americans utilize rhythm to resolve physical tension. The Sugar Shack has been known to art critics for embodying the style of art composition known as Black Romantic. Barnes painted two versions of the Sugar Shack. First, Marvin Gaye asked him for permission to use the painting as an album cover after they finished playing basketball one day. Barnes then augmented the painting by adding references to, Gay, to Gaye's album, such as the, uh, the signs that you see here at the top. At age 18, on a college art class field trip, to the newly desegregated North Carolina Museum of Art in Raleigh, North Carolina, Barnes required, uh, inquired where he could find paintings by Negro artists. The docent responded, your people don't express themselves that way. 
23 years later, in 1979, Barnes returned to the museum for a solo exhibit. In addition to Marvin Gaye's album, Barnes illustrated album covers for the Crusaders, Curtis Mayfield, and B.B. King, and several articles for the San Diego Magazine during his off season um, from being a professional football player. His work is part of the permanent collection of the new Lucas Museum of Narrative Art in South Los Angeles, California. 10 years and many painting lessons later. I was a first year college student at Virginia Commonwealth University. I saw Thomas Blackshear's work day and night here on the left. And I knew I wanted to be an illustrator. I had the same reaction to the artwork of, sugar, of the Sugar Shack on Good Times. This artwork translated my passions into the reality that I could be a working artist. Piece on the right, common thread, is on display in the imprinted exhibition at the Rockwell Museum. Blackish Tea by Kadir Nelson on view, also on view at the Norman Rockwell Museum, is a contemporary example of a Black family's important positive visual representation. Various media distribution outlets serve as a platform for displaying positive or negative cultural imagery created by illustrators. The visibility of illustrators of color and their culturally diverse imagery are crucial components in constructing social perceptions, cultural awareness, and image representation. History has a way of connecting the past with the present. If we understand the historical narrative, it is easier to recognize how to create responsible imagery in the future. Thank you. Robin, thank you so much for those um, really wonderful uh, personal and historical reflections and um, for your incredible work on the exhibition. It's been such an honor. And it's been an honor to work with you and the museum. Thank you, Robin. It's now my pleasure to uh, intro introduce you to all of our panelists uh, for this evening. Uh, our next program is called Hidden in Plain Sight, Illustrated Ceramics and American Identity. Hidden in Plain Sight, illustrations on porcelain and ceramic ware have throughout the history uh, throughout history, transformed functional objects into message bearers for a wide range of political and propagandistic causes, whether exchanged by heads of state or acquired for, for use or display in domestic settings. Leslie Farron of Farron Contemporary will discuss the imagery drawn from popular 19th century prints that was reproduced on widely distributed ceramics, portraying historical events, indigenous people, and notable explorers, inventors, and politicians through a white European lens. The panel will explore how these seemingly ordinary objects, including Rockwell collector plates, have helped to establish firmly held beliefs about American identity. Artists Jacqueline Bishop, Paul Scott, Elizabeth Alexander, Nikki Johnson, and Judy Chartrand will discuss contemporary ceramics, which reject systems of racial oppression and invite reconsideration of the sanitized versions of history that was, that was presented for generations. I'm now very pleased to introduce you to our panelists. Leslie Farron is the director of Farron Contemporary in North Adams, Massachusetts and Project Art in Cummington, Mass. Specializing in contemporary ceramic art from the 1950s to the present. She is an internationally respected curator focused on ceramics, working in support of artists, private collectors, and in partnerships with galleries and museums throughout the world. Leslie has been an outstanding partner uh, on this exhibition, and we are honored to feature her collections in Imprinted Illustrating Race. Jacqueline Bishop is an accomplished writer, academic, and visual artist with exhibitions in Belgium, Morocco, Italy, 
Cape Verde, the USA, Jamaica, and far beyond. Clinical full professor at New York University, she has received many awards and honors, and her recent ceramic work consists of brightly colored bone china plates used symbolically in Caribbean homes, which explore how these objects hid their violent legacy of slavery and colonialism in the Atlantic world. Paul Scott is a Cumbrian-based artist with a diverse practice and an international reputation, creating individual pieces that blur the boundaries between fine, fine art, craft, and design. He is well known for research into printed vitreous surfaces, as well as his characteristic blue and white artworks in glazed ceramic. Elizabeth Alexander, is an interdisciplinary artist specializing in sculptures and installations made from deconstructed domestic materials. She studied sculpture at the Cranbrook Ac Academy and Mass College of Art, where she discovered the complex nature of dissecting objects of nostalgia. Her art has been exhibited nationwide and she's associate professor at the University of North Carolina School of the Arts. Nikki Johnson is an artist, curator, and speaker. Raised in New Mexico, she has spent her adult life living across the United States, uh, including San Francisco, Memphis, Tennessee, and beyond. She's taught at universities and curated local and national exhibitions, and her artwork is in several public and private collections. Her fitting in the squares, which she will discuss this evening, is a self-portrait composed with segments of Norman Rockwell commemorative plates. Judy Chartrand is a Manitoba Cree artist born in Kamloops, British Columbia, and was raised in a marginalized neighborhood located in Vancouver Skid Row area in the early 1960s. She confronts issues of post-colonialism, socioeconomic inequity, and indigenous knowledge expressed through the mediums of ceramics, found objects, archival photos, and traditional techniques that include beading, tufting, and porcupine quilling on hide. It is a great honor to welcome all of our panelists, and I'll now turn over the program to Leslie Farron. Thank you all. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you for this opportunity to share our exhibition, Our America, Who's America, with all of you tonight. It is currently on view at our gallery, a short distance from the Norman Rockwell Museum. We are based in the Northern Berkshires on the campus of MassMOCA, Massachusetts Museum of Contemporary Art in North Adams. The logo you see here was created to convey this geography and the style inspired by the back stamps and merchant marks on ceramic plates. I use the quote to introduce this topic tonight, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Uh, more, than, uh, more than 100 years after it was written by George Santayan in his book, Reason in Common Sense, it was published in 1905 often requoted, misquoted, and reworded by others, including Winston Churchill in the midst of World War II. In 2022, we are watching the past repeat itself with the rise of fascism, ethnic wars, racially motivated violence, and genocide. We live in an echo chamber of repetition with hourly proof that despite our unlimited access to knowledge, we are seemingly destined to repeat the past and in fact, fueled by collected memories. These memories are carried by objects, conveyed by form, illustrated on plates, mass produced and popularized through printed images. They are imprinted on us by their sheer existence and evident wherever they are visible. In this symposium held in conjunction with the exhibition imprinted Illustrating Race, we will view and discuss these images and consider not just what was, but what is hidden in plain sight. Tonight, we will look at a few of the three-dimensional objects that hide in homes, their likenesses available via search on the internet and now reassembled in collections of Americana. We have the opportunity to hear from international contemporary artists who use these objects to inform their artistic practice and present their work, not just in dialogue with colonialism in Americas, but throughout the world. 
We sincerely appreciate the opportunity and support provided by curators Robin Phillips Pendleton and Stephanie Plunkett to include ceramic works in the rich and layered exhibition here at the Norman Rockwell Museum. We are also grateful to the artists who are speaking tonight for their time and ongoing creative work that reflects upon the past, unpacks history, and brings attention to origin stories. Thank you to the Rockwell Institute of American Studies for providing a public platform for us to speak to the audience tonight and the add the recorded version to the excellent resources developed through this exhibition for future use. Our talk tonight will explore the narratives delivered by these objects through image, characterization, and stereotype, whether overt, bombastic, or subtle, and cunning, and the role they play in forming collective memory that continues to impact the way people see themselves and others today. As we approach the fall national holidays that commemorate the past, watch photo ops during election season staged in front of public monuments, when we celebrate with our families, pull out the fine dishes and look around at what's on the mantle, or see what's hanging on the walls of our families' homes, and when we vote what is hanging in the government buildings, we will think about what is head, hidden in plain sight. We begin with Rockwell Kent, who was commissioned by Vernon Kilns, a California company, to design three sets of ceramic tableware. One of these sets is the Our America series. We took the name for our show from this series, but ask now, who's America? Kent himself answered that question in 1939, presenting images of laborers, buildings, and landscapes in three colors on forms designed by Gail Turnbull. The company also produced hundreds of souvenir plates that showed romanticized character characterizations of people, places, and glorified achievements. The creation of Our America, Vernon Ware, um, Vernon Ware is Vernon's expression of gratitude for joy in our magnificent country the mightiest nation in the world, last great stronghold of peace and brotherhood. We believe you will welcome our America into your home to use each day with pride, to hand down through the succeeding generations as an enduring record of the America we are living in today. That's directly from these brochures. Uh, I acquired works like the Made in Occupied Japan pair of blackface clowns teapot shaped salt and pepper shakers many years ago. I continued to collect as I traveled and slowly assembled a casual collection of Americana and plates that caught my attention for what they conveyed. I did not have a goal in mind, but over time I got more and more selective. They were not related to my work with contemporary artists until I met Paul Scott and learned I was not alone in wanting to learn more from and about them. The uranium glass was introduced to me and purchased in 2019 specifically for use by Paul in his series of souvenirs of Shiprock, Arizona, and then again in 2020 to exhibit in context with his works in museum exhibitions. Merchant marks and back stamps are on almost every plate and figurine and have identifying marks on the base or back. The images used, designs, and type fonts on commercial wares indicate clues to the merchants who ordered the personalized production. Additional information can be gleaned from the markings that might include dates of production and completion. Com contemporary artists often use the backs of their works and their signatures and printed text to identify themselves as the makers and convey information relevant to the content in their work. Fleeing Indians by Walker China was designed and commissioned by Amherst College, portraying the first bioterrorist Lord Jeffrey Amherst chasing Indians around the rims. These plates were in use in the dining halls um, of the all male private college until 1973 when they were removed from service. Native American students were greeted with these dishes when they arrived. We acquired the service from a 1970 alum who used the dishes to support research and an academic program with the college in 2020. Mohawk Trail souvenirs. Well, based as we are in the Berkshires and New Rye, Connecticut Valley, we respectfully acknowledge that the buildings we inhabit and the roads we travel are located on the ancestral homelands of many tribes, many native tribes that include the Pocum, Pocum, Pocumtuck, 
no not no non oh sorry um no not no not a, Nipmuc and Stockbridge Muncie Mohicans who were forced from their homelands. Name the Mohawk Trail. The Mohawk tri tribe is one of the five in the Iroquois Nation in upstate New York and was used, and they used the trail for trading and raids, one of which established domination and thus the name. In 1914, the road was improved and designated a scenic tourist route uh, by the Massachusetts legislature and endorsed by National Geographic and the Automobile Association, which spawned tourist attractions and souvenir shops. The works on view in this slide are ceramic versions that depict the famous hairpin turn in North Adams and the Hail to Sunrise statue in Charlemont. Paul Scott and I met in person in 2012 for the first time when he shared the galleys of his soon to be published book, Horizon, Transferware and Contemporary Ceramics and featured the hairpin turn, which led to his visit, collection research and um, multiple visits starting in 2013 with many adventures in pursuit of what has now evolved into his new American scenery series. This work became my excuse to seek out and purchase more plates and souvenirs to lend to his exhibitions and a crash course in the fictions surrounding American history. Like many of the artists you will hear from during these past few years, we've looked at our own identities, our family histories and had conversations with our elders to learn about the stories passed down and the questionable assumed narratives that made us who we are as individuals and members of the communities. Cape Coast Castle. Paul will be speaking about this platter during his talk, but I included here as one of the works that best illustrates how our collection is used to activate uh, um, museum collections and foster discussions when presented by institutions where historic transferware collections exist but may not own this specific work. It is not an image typically categorized as American scenery because it is not, it is Africa. However, the deep scratches in the surface show that Americans used the platter and likely was presented at the table by descendants of the Africans portrayed in this image. My purchase of the platter was solely to offer it as a loan to accompany Paul's work when presented in museums. On the left is the work presented at the Norman Rockwell Museum and on the right at the RISD Museum in context of his new American scenery show. These are just a few of my souvenir plates. Um, these are English and I acquired many of them during the pandemic when travel was curtailed, like many of the collectors I work with, it provided time to do online collecting. I purchased plates that illustrated themes we were looking deeply at. These plates shown here are English versions showing portraits, events, buildings, tall monuments, and commemorate locations both well-known and obscure. The images are self-evident when shown in this context. I now have more than I wish to acknowledge. This is Judy Chartrand's counteract. Judy will be speaking about this work, but I include it here because it's stuck in my mind for months as we develop the concept for Our America, Whose America. Inspired by its embedded whiteness and the way the objects above the counter were amassed, we designed our show to include works from the collection in conversation with contemporary artists like Judy, whose artworks are shown on the shelf above the stool. Our America Who's America was co-curated by Lauren Lovato Coyne, an artist and writer who is also now, now our gallery director. Inspired by the conversations I was having with Stephanie and other curators um, and the artists about my growing collection, I was inspired by the works of represented artists. Together, we launched into the selection of artists and issued invitations to respond to the collection. In addition to the artists we were already working with, we approached emerging and established artists who had been on our radars. The 23 who are included are just a few of the many who are working along these lines, using their own identities, family, and cultural histories to create new artworks. So these are just a few of the pictures that um, my wonderful photographer, John Pollock, has taken for years of our 
gallery and he focused in on um, the displays that we presented the works that include um, the historic works side by side with the contemporary. Paul did um, the series of 12 plates that are uh, views of New York and he did them in collaboration with an Instagram friend he met, uh, Leah Mitch, who goes by Fleur de Sel. So like the old plates that show buildings, he wanted to show New York as it is now. These are Jacqueline's works on view at the gallery, the market woman, and she'll be talking more about this in her presentation. These are um, Judy's piece, one of Judy's pieces um, shown side by side with the Walker China. Judy um, will be showing quite a number of pieces, but I wanted to show these because uh, they are her most recent. Um, a few of the artists who aren't here tonight um, are Michelle Erickson, whose work is always dealing with history and uh, historic materials, and she reproduces them and then um, works with contemporary social commentary. Beth Lowe is a model minority, and this piece, you can see her use of the back stamps to title the piece and sign her work. Momoko Usami, um, these are two very complicated um, illustrations on porcelain plates. And these are the, the same plates with the back stamps. I like what she said about her work. Now more than ever, artists have a responsibility in society to document what's happening in the world, to pass it on to future generations, and to help heal broken hearts with curiosity and beauty. These are Crank. These are collaborative team. And Leo Quiles, um, who is documenting images and people from Puerto Rico. And here we are at the Norman Rockwell Museum during installation with Stephanie's wonderful statements that have informed me so much about the way to look at this work. This is Edris Eckert, and um, I'm going to stand up because the lights just went off in here and I can't read what I have to say. Here I am, back again. Um, Edris is actually, was the last piece I bought. And I said to Stephanie, um, if I buy this piece, will you put it in the show? And she said, absolutely. So um, this piece was delivered directly to the Norman Rockwell Museum. Uh, it's made in Cleveland during the Works Progress Administration, one of many that were produced to help children and others achieve literacy during the Depression. This woman artist changed her name from Edith to Edris to hide her gender and went on to succeed professionally as a result. Her work with the WPA in literacy led to a commission for Eleanor Roosevelt's home in Hyde Park. So this is our whole case, so beautifully presented with the illustrations that um, uh, we've been looking through and that are throughout the catalog. Uh, in conclusion, I wanna acknowledge and thank my long-term friend, time friend and colleague, Lori Norton Moffat, the director of Norman Rockwell Museum for introducing me to deputy director and chief curator, Stephanie Plunkett who has guided and mentored me, and by extension, the artist presenting tonight since we began this work in 2020. In addition, I wanna thank Rich Bradway, Thomas Mesquita, and Barbara Runback, along with all the others at Norman Rockwell Museum who worked on this exhibition and symposium. Finally, I wanna thank my co-curator of Our America Who's America, Lauren Lovato Coyne, and our team at Fair and Contemporary for bringing um, for their work in bringing the show to life. 
their daily conversations with the public in the gallery and steady building of the virtual presentation on our website will continue to share what we have all learned in the year we've worked together in collaboration with the Norman Rockwell Museum. Thank you so much. Leslie, thank you for those fascinating comments and um, for all the support you've, you've given us. This uh, subject has really been enlightening and really has enhanced the exhibition greatly. So we thank you so much for that. Well, uh, I, it's very mutual. So I'm looking forward to hearing the presentations just as much as you are and hopefully our audience. Thank you so much. And I think we're going to uh, now introduce Jacqueline, Jacqueline Bishop. Uh, well, it's, it's absolutely wonderful um, to be here. Um, I wanna thank Leslie and Stephanie for inviting me. Um, my presentation is uh, five minutes long. It's not very long. And um, I'm going to start, uh, I have two parts. I have a very short, um, document um, PowerPoint. And I also have a film just recently came out on um, The Market Woman, which is my most recent body of work. But I thought I would start off by introducing you to the women in my family and how I came to be doing this work. Next image, please. Right. Um, so what you're looking at is my great grandmother, my grandmother, my mother, and myself, uh, four Jamaican, four Jamaican American women. Two of us are Jamaican American. And these were the women who kept decorative plates at their homes in Jamaica um, that I was thinking about as I was working on it. My great grandmother's um, name is Celeste, my grandmother Emma, my mother Marjorie, and myself. Next image. Right. And so one of the ways, the key ways of showing your womanhood that you had arrived as a woman on the island of Jamaica is you have your mahogany cabinet specially made and you have your dishes within your mahogany cabinet. And so I grew up seeing all these wonderful dishes that I was not allowed to touch. I was not allowed to touch them at all. And they came out on special occasions. And so what you're looking at is a Jamaican mahogany cabinet. Next image. Right, uh, again, another Jamaican mahogany cabinet with these fantastic images. And so now we're going to move into showing the film that um, was made about this, our, our excerpts from the film. This series is very near and dear to my heart. Um, it's the Market Woman series. My great grandmother was a market woman. My grandmother was a market woman. And my great gr grandmother's mother was a market woman. So the market woman is deep inside of who I am. I think the market woman is the most ubiquitous figure that comes out of the Caribbean. She is used to represent the Caribbean. But interestingly enough, she is almost invisible. For me, the, the market woman came off the ships where she was enslaved and started walking and selling, and she has not stopped since then. And I think we in the Caribbean whole, owe an, an enormous debt to this woman who has fed us for centuries now. I'm an art historian. I was trained in art history in the UK university, but did not really recognize until I came back to the Caribbean and began to work with these images that it was no longer acceptable simply to utilize these images and to reproduce them over and over again as though they were the truth. And there's a whole history behind the, the market woman, the whole history of legislative practice which tried to control these women. This is not visible in these prints and these other images which actually demonstrate quite a bucolic image. To me, the importance of what Jacqueline is doing with her dinner series is disrupting this kind of iconography. And we're going to move on to a second 
part of the film. Uh -huh. I'm thinking a lot about the market woman. And so I go ahead and I find the, the kinds of images that I think I want to use. And I start put things that fall naturally together. And so the only thing that was not intuitive about this process was the fact that I knew that I wanted to have both contemporary women and women from the period of slavery. I talk to these women, <laughs> you know. I talk to my ancestors. I say to them all the time, could you please help me to tell your story? I wanted to give these women back their beauty, their femininity, their sexuality. I wanted to make plates that if my great grandmother or my grandmother who kept decorative plates took one up and look at it, they would feel good within themselves. So it was important for me for the plates to be beautiful. I think being able to work with Jacqueline, who is a black contemporary woman artist, allows us to have that lived experience, that genuine authority. She is able to reinterpret these images in a way that I think, I think most other people wouldn't be able to, and reflect and give dignity and give power back to these women. And I think it allows us as curators, as us as visitors, to then have a much more nuanced understanding. Thank you so much. Um, and I look forward to the other presentations. Thank you, Jacqueline. Uh, the film is available in its full entirety and um, we'll provide those resources if asked. Our next speaker is Paul Scott, um, who has had to pre-record his um, presentation due to um, the fact that he is in um, Cumbria, um, UK and it's very late tonight. Hiya, my name is Paul Scott and welcome to my studio here in Cumbria in Northern England. I'm sorry I can't be with you sort of live today, but um, uh, time differences and what have you make that difficult. But uh, anyway, here's the short talk that I prepared for you about transferware for the 21st century. Transferwares are industrially printed ceramics uh, that were originally created to imitate export Chinese porcelain. Uh, they were often narrative or pictorial in, in nature, and in the early 19th century, tens of thousands of wares depicting the new American Republic were sent across the Atlantic from Staffordshire. And production continued well into the 20th century um, both on both sides of the Atlantic. These early wares um, depicted you know, landscapes and scenes of civic pride. This is the Philadelphia Waterworks, uh, Fairmount near Philadelphia by Joseph Stubbs. And in updating the transfer wares for the 21st century, uh, here is the Flint Waterworks. Uh, clearly not a, a source of civic pride. Uh, there's, a, there's a pool of melted lead at the bottom of the plate. The water crisis in Flint, Michigan began in 2014 when the city switched its drinking water supply from Detroit's system to the Flint River in a cost-cutting move uh, and the resulting foul-tasting discoloured water piped into Flint homes for 18 months caused all kinds of health problems and the, the Civil Rights Commission, the state established body, concluded that the poor government response to the Flint crisis was the result of systemic racism. One of the things that one needs to understand about transferware is that the images were remediated from different media. So this is a perfect exemplar of how images move between media and become part of our collective consciousness. This painting by Benjamin West, William Penn's Treaty, painted in 1771, uh, was nearly, it's nearly a hundred years after the supposed event took place. Nevertheless, this image has become iconic in American culture as part of American history. It was made like this because it was disseminated widely 
through engravings, uh, reproductions of the original. And these engravings were then reproduced in different media. And this image is still available today. This is from the Getty Images. You can still buy this image to use uh, and, and embed it into products and what have you. The interesting thing about this image is that uh, it's a, it, it depicts a legend, a myth. that In actual fact, no treaty exists. And the popular assumption that it does exist must probably be credited to West's painting. Here are the images on a Roland Marcellus historical pottery picture from about 1900. Transferwares are not the innocent, pretty things that are sometimes assumed to be. Transferwares depict a particular version of history, a colonial white settler version of American history. So this has become an iconic image and embedded in people's consciousness, the idea that there was some treaty with the Indians. This is a modern iconic image. It came to represent uh, one of the defining images of the Dakota Pipeline protests at Standing Rock in 2016. Unlike West's paintings and its reproductions, this is one that records and depicts a real event. So I have updated Penn's treaty with an iconic 21st century image. This is Standing Rock number one after Ryan Visions, with Mega May Plenty Chief Lakota Oyate on horseback. And on the back of the plate, the legend explains the image on the front. One of the things that I would read to you is that in the United States there have been hundreds of treaties made with native peoples and not one, not a single one, has ever been upheld. These images on transferwares are in museum collections around the United States and of course in Britain too. Here's another iconic image. This is also a fiction. I first saw this piece in RISD Museum uh, when I was researching their collection of transferwares. And at first, I, and I'd never seen it before, and I was bowled over by the, by the stunning object that I held in my hands. And it was only gradually did the, did the realisation of what it depicted dawn on me. So this beautiful object depicts an awful trade one where millions of enslaved Africans were transported across the Atlantic. And the reason it's beautiful is that it was intended to be so. It's based upon a painting uh, of which this is a reproduction. And it was commissioned by His Royal Highness, the Duke of Clarence, uh, in the early uh, 19th century as part of his campaign against the abolition of the slave trade. This was a piece of pro-slavery propaganda purporting to show the beautiful scenes surrounding the capture and enslavement of Africans. Now in Britain we have this sort of uh, uh, self-congratulatory thing about being the first major country to abolish slavery. Of course Britain was one of the first uh, nations involved in the in the business um, and in the northern United States there's a similar sort of uh, uh, pleasure taken in the fact that that the northern United States stood against the southern uh, slaveholding states but actually if we look more closely at history it tells us a slightly different story and this is a souvenir of Providence over which I've overlaid the Cape Coast Castle Plateau because the American slave trade from 1727 to 1807 might better be called the Rhode Island slave trade. Throughout the 18th century, Rhode Island merchants controlled between 60 and 90% of the American trade 
in African enslaved people. And of course, that enslavement has repercussions hundreds of years later. And in the 1960s, during the, the civil rights demonstrations, uh, uh, police set upon peaceful demonstrators as this race riot um, Andy Warhol piece uh, so, so uh, perfectly depicted. I fused Andy Warhol's piece together with my reference to Enoch Woods in this platter called After Wood and Warhol. Depressingly, after I made that, George Floyd was murdered and more peaceful Black Lives Matter protests this time uh, in Portland, Oregon and around the United States were broken up by riot police uh, sent by Donald Trump. So this is uh, an update uh, on a souvenir of Portland Platter place made by Roland Marcellus. You'll notice in the right hand side above the riot police there's a little cartouche of a statue in Portland called the coming of the white man. And just to return to Native Americans and American Indians, uh, in the 1950s and 60s a whole generation of Navajo men were lost due to the effects of uranium mining. Uh, The back tells the story of the scandal. If you want to read more about it, these books are to be recommended. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. He will be um, watching this the way we will in a recorded version. So thank you, Paul. That was wonderful. Um, our next speaker is Elizabeth Alexander. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for um, coming to listen to us speak. And of course, thank you to Leslie Farron um, and the Farron Contemporary and the Norman Rockwell Museum for um, including my work in this conversation. Um, so my name is Elizabeth Alexander, and I use forms and materials typically associated with American domestic harmony to unpack the social, cultural, and psychological uh, effects of these uh, ideals of domesticity, success, and safety. My interest in exploring American values and the idealism of home stem from a loving yet tumultuous working class upbringing, where our home is at the center of our world. And I like to think about what it might look like if the spaces we inhabit embodied our emotions and the more complicated elements of ourselves and our experiences. The work I'll be talking about tonight uh, largely comes from a series that started with this installation, Keeping Up Appearances, where I realized that the tea set that I cut a uh, pattern out of as a, you know, sort of as a prop within the scene um, held as much potency as this more operatic, uh, deconstructed living space did. And so for the past 14 years, I've been uh, removing um, print from um, porcelain ware and when I'm removing these florals, I think a lot about um, how I'm additionally removing these signifiers of value from these objects. Um, and I think a lot about the value that we place on objects and how that reflects back on our own value within our culture and how um, for women that's most often um, objects within the domestic sphere. So in 2015, I moved from Massachusetts to Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and was probably naively surprised to find uh, this relic from Jim Crow in the town center right outside the courthouse, um, a Confederate statue that was removed in 2019. And, um, you know, the national conversation about how these, um, when and why all of these objects were erected hadn't really happened yet. Um, but what had happened was the 2016 election. Um, and not long after that, about a year and a half after moving to Winston-Salem, I came across um, this full set of Confederate commemorative plates in a junk shop in town. Um, and these plates were printed um, or produced um, by Lennox uh, Oxford China, and they were commissioned by the White House of the Confederacy in 1971. 
And uh, I just wanted you to sort of see the precious packaging and these all of these signifiers of um, of the value of these objects that are supposed to tell you not only to cherish these objects but to pass them down to future generations. You know everything from archival boxes to um, information cards that inform you that the Smithsonian Museum has um, one of these uh, sets in their collection because they were gifted to them um, by the White House of the Confederacy to uh, certificates of authenticity. Um, and that marketing worked because uh, only a few months ago, these plates were, in, um, were installed in an exhibition at a, a, a library, a public library in Texas. Um, and I just wanted you to notice words like rare, um, special edition, limited edition, um, perfect display for public education. They point out the 24 karat gold um, treatment on the rim and even uh, say that the, um, the list of names um, of the trustees that uh, commissioned these plates um, are, is an impressive list. And so it's all of this language that really conflates um, these plates, but also uses them almost in a weaponizing way by placing them in a public environment. Um, so I, it took me a few years to actually figure out what to do with the plates. And I ultimately decided not to remove everything like I typically do, but to only focus on the symbols of war and the symbols of the Confederacy and leave the American landscape um, and, and language about Amer the American um, landscape within all of the, um, the plate and all of the materials. And I also decided um, not only to remove it, but to keep it, but to separate it out and um, display it below. And I wanted to talk about how, um, you know, th that there's all this conversation about, um, you know, that removing these, these symbols and these objects is this kind of oppressive and this very precious like removal of history, but um, the fact of what happened doesn't change. It's really, you know, that doesn't change with the, the fact that these objects exist, that these monuments exist. Um, and that, you know, we really need to kind of choose what, what we're celebrating. Um, and that, you know, all of these existed, all of these events existed and that the dust from those events is still shaping the American landscape that we live with now. Um, and I, I titled this series, The Great Enemy of Truth after a John F. Kennedy quote where he said, for the great enemy of truth is very often not the lie, deliberate, contrived, and dishonest, but the myth, persistent, persuasive, and unrealistic. And at that time, um, fake news was sort of within the rhetoric uh, most commonly heard and used uh, in American culture. While I was researching for that series, I uh, learned that I come from uh, a lineage uh, or ancestors that fought and died for the Confederacy at, at Pickett's Charge. And so I, it made me rethink the series that I was working on. It made me you know, realize that I was no longer a removed party, that I was reckoning my own space within these systems, um, that it wasn't just the social critique. Um, and, and I think growing up in Massachusetts, we kind of are taught that we have almost a pass at this uh, at our place in, in within the Civil War because we were on the right side of history but you know learning that about my family shows that that place doesn't necessarily um, absolve you of anything and um, you know that it's important to really reflect back on you know where you come from and the reality of uh, your history um, so I've been collecting uh, more plates. So since the uh, Great Enemy of Truth, I have another 22 plates, um, 20 of which are come from paintings by Mort Kunstler uh, in his Civil War series, focusing on specifically the Confederate um, imagery. And you can see that these images are a lot more um, vivid and vibrant and almost more romanticized. And I want to point out the titles of, of um, both the the plate series as well as the um, paintings themselves. So there's two series. One is called the Heroes of the Confederacy Collection and the other one is Jackson and Lee Legends in Gray Collection. And titles of paintings um, where these were culled from called I Wish She Was Ours, It's All My Fault, The Distant Thunder, kind of points to that romanticized um, image of um, this almost like glory, glorious American history. 
um, that uh, Paul Scott was just talking about in his uh, lecture. And I also chose to gild the um, cap for the little vial that the dust was collected in um, to kind of echo these gilded edges on the plates. And I titled this work, A Mightier Work is Ahead after I'm um, paraphrased from a Frederick Douglass um, speech called Our Work is Not Done, where he said, but a mightier work than the abolition of slavery now looms up um, before the abolitionists. When we have taken the chains off the slave, as I believe we shall do, we shall find a harder resistance to the second purpose of this great association than we have found even upon slavery itself. And I believe the existence of this panel itself shows that we are very much still within that moment that Douglas predicted. Um, and so I thank you for your time. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, I just want to um, tell the audience that there's um, undoubtedly some questions and those should go into the Q&A and we will um, answer them as soon as we're through the presentation. Um, Nikki, you are up next. Hello, uh, it's a pleasure to participate in this panel and speak with you all this evening. The focus of my presentation is the artwork you see here titled Fitting In With The Squares. Um, but before I jump into the specifics of this piece, I'd like to introduce to you my practice more broadly and provide a context so you understand how my pieces are imagined and made. At times, a material will drive the creative process. I often take apart or disassemble objects into hundreds of pieces to build them anew. This process provides time for me to unpack histories, research, and discover better questions about the work I am making as I handle the materials. The images above show the transformation of metal signage from shuttered Planned Parenthood healthcare centers in Wisconsin. Hills and Valleys incorporates the hand punched and sheared metal signage and mirror from Hobby Lobby uh, to form this large sculptural piece that reflects its audience. At other times, a major cultural event brings a vision for new work. The Honorable Ruth Bader Ginsburg died on September 18th, 2020. Our country was in the sixth month of COVID lockdown. The next day, the US death toll passed 200,000. By this point in the pandemic, I'd become accustomed to working alone. However, my grief in her passing brought with it a desire to be with community. The humble button became my favorite material. And then I found sitting uh, down and stitching brought me solace. As the piece came together, each button beautiful in its own way, I began to feel as though I was working with a community, touching the very items strangers I'd never meet wore every day at, and sat in contemplation of the lasting effect of Justice Ginsburg's service. The final artwork is a life-size stitch portrait of her flag-draped casket with sprays of white roses as it sat on the steps of the Supreme Court. The final artwork, oh, let's see, uh, Justice in Repose RBG was shown in Milwaukee City Hall, providing a space for public reflection on the anniversary of her passing. Fitting in with the squares appeared in my mind after the results of the 2016 presidential election came in. As weeks passed, the projects in my studio went from full color to black and white and then to black on black. I reverted into my sketchbook and pulled back into drawing and journaling. Soon I was arranging the shelves and combing through boxes. While stacking and sorting, I came across an old photograph in a memory box. It was an accidental self-portrait, the kind you discover after printing a roll of film. The moment it captured took place in the late 90s after an iron pour. I'd just taken off my leathers. My fingers were still sooty with coke. A short time after this photo was taken, I'd withdraw from school and drive my 92 VW Golf packed with everything I owned to California. I was halfway through my bachelor's degree, surrounded by friends and family, and yet I knew in order to become who I was meant to be, I had to leave. I'd met the path of self-actualization. As I continued through the studio, it became clear that my habit of thrifting commemorative plates had gone a little out of hand. Amassed slowly a couple dollars at a time for over a decade, I now had a few hundred Norman Rockwell plates. The assortment was representative of what was on the shelves. Stacks of old white men interacting with school-aged white children, old white married couples nestled in domestic settings, middle-aged white men happily doing chores, white women in the kitchen, white women nestled into furniture with pets, white couples enjoying leisurely activities, 
comfortable white families, safe white children, and happy white teenagers sat in piles in every available service in the studio. Seeing the collection together stung with an uncanny relevance. Shining back at me was an America where father knew best, women knew their place, and people of color were not part of the story. It was as if it was MAGA illustrated. And then I understood. I saw the photograph take form out of the pieces of the plates. Aesthetically, they shared a color palette. They also resisted each other in a way that instinctually fit. As per usual, before I set to work, I headed to the library. What I found was as Rockwell's imagery shifted from advertisement to commemorative, the original commercial purpose for his illustration faded into the background. The consumer experience of the original ad and the plate decades later are nuanced and quite different. In 1920, the melody of music and the melody of light at the piano asked the public to envision future evenings with friends improving with the addition of Mazda Edison light bulbs. In 1984, close harmony encouraged a nostalgic reminiscence of evenings in the past spent with friends and family. The light bulbs became a tertiary concern, if that. Assembled into cohesive thematic series, often across a mismatch of periods in Rockwell's career, Simpler Times, American Heritage, Rediscovering Women, and other plate lines provided a platform for his illustrations to exist without the trappings of their history. By the mid-1970s, with decades of his ad work being reproduced on commemorative plates, Norman Rockwell's career spanned over a half a century. Championed the painter of American life, Rockwell was a technically gifted commercial illustrator and household name. Oh, sorry. Uh, he crafted narratives of everyday working class white American life during the Jim Crow era. This was the audience his advertisers and publishers targeted, and he catered to their wishes. Beginning in the early 1960s, Rockwell's works were included, oh, included imagery sympathetic to the civil rights movement. However, those works were not selected for commemoration. Instead, one decade after the Civil Rights Act became law, a decade remembered for strides made in women's rights and the end of the Vietnam War and acute uh, civil unrest, plate manufacturers chose to commemorate selections of Rockwell's imagery that served to reify traditional gender power dynamics and placate white fears within an ever-changing American cultural landscape. Finding these plates in large numbers at thrift stores underscored their failure as heirloom mementos. However, in the aftermath of the 2016 presidential election with white nationalism on the rise and restrictions on women's bodies ratcheting up, it was as if their messaging had found new hosts. The indelibility of their messages had spread across the Twitter sphere and was being shouted by talking heads on various media platforms. These plates no longer appeared to be relics of the past, fulfilling an aging generation's need to self-soothe. This America, untethered from the social niceties of Rockwell's era, was in power again. Many plates I picked up came in original boxes with certificates of authenticity and at least one brochure promising a high second market value. Averaging $20 in the late 1970s, equivalent to about 80 bucks now, um, they were made in limited editions, though they offered numbered, often numbered in the thousands. These clubs that were advertised um, may, uh, were highly popular. From the late 1970s through the mid 1980s, collector plates enjoyed one of the longest running speculative markets of any modern day collectible. The bubble burst in the late 1980s. The largest cohort of, to purchase commemorative plates belonged to the great generation. This group of consumers grew up on limited means during the Great Depression, experienced World War II as young adults, and retired from the working class, having achieved higher levels of material comfort than previous generations. Noted for their rubber band balls, hoarding of used tools, and scraps of cloth, they bought commemorative plates as investment pieces. The setup in my studio includes a tile saw, an assortment of tile and glass blades, and a pile of plates. I worked in an assembly line, starting with stacks of 10, I ran them through the saw and, and made strips and then trimmed the strips down into squares. 10 plates took about five hours, yielded around 300 squares. I'd end up cutting 9,000 to get the 2,400 of the right color I needed. In the warm months, I'd take breaks when the tile saw water tray needed to be refilled. And in the winter, I'd fill the tray with warm water and work until it got cold. As the plates became strips and the strips became squares, elements in the illustrations I hadn't noticed before came into focus. Rockwell's tightly constructed narratives became fragmentary abstractions. 
the visual boundaries he made by placing a figure or an object in the foreground were gone. The single gesture of a hand, the expression on a face, the tonal mood set in a foreground and background all retained the mark of his hand, but the elements were free. A one inch format maintained a light curvature from the plate, making the material recognizable, referential, and familiar. Often one, uh, often one could find me wandering around my studio muttering um, quasi visual recipes. And this one here would be two thirds darker with slightly angled lighter right side. Between cutting plates and sorting tiles and laying out the pattern, I spent 18 months building the portrait. I took breaks to complete a few other projects. And after each intermission, I'd return to her. And each time the portrait provided new challenges, both in its technical needs and reflective personal work. Through this process, numerous pathways of understanding both the cultural value of the materials and the personal underpinnings of the image became clear to me. The experience slowly revealed the formative and persistent role of resistance and resilience on a woman in American society. I came to understand the women in this portrait to be so much like the young women I've worked with. I see in her shades of my mother who raised me in an era she helped fight to secure. I see a woman with greater agency over her life than her foremothers. I see a woman who knows what to take from life, what to leave, and how to build a life out of the pieces that fit. Thank you all for your time this evening. Um, and I look forward to your thoughts during the Q&A. Thank you so much, Nikki. Um, we've got some questions coming in the chat about um, Rockwell and licensing. So um, as we discussed earlier during the um, uh, <clears throat> during our practice sessions, we thought that might be, come up. So it's getting answered in the chat. Um, Judy, you are on next. Okay, so I come from a family of 13 children. I'm a Manitoba Cree, and I was born in Camels, PC. And from the age of two on, I was uh, raised in a marginalized area in Vancouver that was commonly referred to as Skid Row. It was a neighborhood populated mostly by Chinese, but there were also Japanese and Black Canadians. And in addition, there was a high population of single poor whites who resided in the rooming houses that were abundant in the area. There was not a visible First Nations presence, but we did have family on my mother's side in our lives. Skid Row was an environment where no one was better than the other. I was lucky in that I attended a school where my classmates who were mostly Chinese Canadians challenged me scholastically rather than physically. My backyard was downtown Vancouver. It was an extremely busy few blocks west of Main Street that was a commercial and adult entertainment hub where all of Vancouver residents came to shop, eat, or play. And of course, there was the infamous White Lunch Cafe, cafeteria. The White Lunch had a history of racist policies they were proud to, um, proud to promote the fact that they were an establishment that only hired white workers and served white guests. The racist, the racist hostility was focused on the Chinese, Japanese, and of course, natives. The white only concept proved to be so popular that they became a chain in three prime locations within the city. The racist policies were eventually phased out but the stigma associated with it persisted until the last location closed in the 1980s. In 2000, I became interested in advertising on tin products from the 19th and 20th centuries when I came across a couple of collector books while enrolled at the, into the um, MFA program at the University of Regina in Saskatchewan. I was interested in design and thought the layout, the colors of the ads uh, would have some use in my art practice. So I, I purchased both books. Back at the dormitory, I noticed how so many of these labels consisted of images that revealed the dominant culture's sentiments towards racially identified groups. Many of the household items often featured one dimensional and demeaning caricatures. I soon, I soon learned 
that these images were widely accepted because are acceptable because um, they pose no threat to white society. In fact, they operated to soothe white consciences by making reference to a nostalgic past while also promoting white supremacy through asserting control over naming and depicting Asian, Black, and Native peoples. I began making works that were in accordance with my way of knowing and understanding the world. In 2005, I used the books for reference when I began searching, for, um, searching eBay for racist collectibles. I didn't have any intentions in, for the items that I had collected until I was invited to submit work for a three-person exhibit at an artist-run gallery. It was located a few blocks from what used to be the last white lunch um, location. That became my inspiration for Counteract, made in 2006. I started looking through my collection and chose three objects to enlarge in clay. Then I thought maybe it would be best just to include everything on the shelf and go from there. I had gotten to know one vintage shop owner outside the city and asked him if he had any racist items that were not displayed in the store. He mentioned that he might have one, one item that I'd be interested in and asked me to come back um, the next week. When I did, he, he hauled out a Chinese checkerboard game and asked me if this was suitable. I told him it was unbelievable and paid him what he asked, which only turned out to be about $50. In presenting the collectibles, I compiled them into three groups. Above, there is a ceramic, um, ceramic shaker bottle with a metal top known as Sprinkle Plenty. It's a water sprinkler to be used when ironing clothes. It was produced by the Cardinal China Company based out of New Jersey. Um, there are a few versions of these figures um, all made in the USA. The origins of the Chinese laundry stereotypes stem from the gold rush era when anti-Asian sentiments restricted the Chinese to positions of cooks, laundrymen, domestic servants, servants and merchants. Laundry was considered a woman's work, so it was low status and posed no threat to white male jobs. Next to that is a vintage talcum powder lid uh, tin with the label Jap Rose, represented as the geisha woman. Some of the more prevalent stereotypes that apply to the geisha is she is a subservient, exotic, passive, and sexualized woman whose existence is set out to please men. Above is a label, a vintage label that reads the rickshaw boy, indigo blueprint. This label refers to South African rickshaw drivers, but the stereotype implies being on the bottom rung of society. Natives are often portrayed as the noble savage, the Indian princess, the older, ugly, and dirty squaw, the loyal sidekick, the blood thirsty um, savage, and let's not forget the widespread, the widespread one, the drunken Indian. The items I collected hit every single one of these marks. They are regurgitated over and over again for use within media and advertising. They are geared for white consumption and incorporate many of the culturally offensive stereotypes that were engineered by Hollywood. It appears to be a view that is more easily understood as derogatory against, against the backdrop of a lived history. Out of all the racial groups, Black Americans have the most toxic images system systemically applied to them. The negative and detrimental stereotype labels often overlap one another. And this creates a racism that's so strongly embedded that it becomes difficult to reduce or eliminate. Any object found in the kitchen could be and often was transformed into anti-Black pro propaganda. The Sambo stereotype pushes the notion of a jolly overgrown child who was happy to serve as a slave. He's also portrayed as naturally lazy and in need of direction. 
This was one of the ways to justify the institution of slavery. Another evil, um, another evil creation is the pickaninny stereotype. It focuses on the children. Then there's also the gollywog figure that was based on a black minstrel doll that became popular in England and other parts of Europe. There has been four decades of debate on whether this figure is a lovable icon or a racist symbol. So like many, oh, did somebody say something? So many of these ugly narratives and labels um, have so much weight that they are still casually tossed around as slurs to this day. This is the final piece, the final wall piece that consists of a cork board used to display collected paperworks such as photos, magazine advertisements, anti-Asian propaganda, as well as postcards. After the Pearl Harbor attacks, much anti-Japanese paraphernalia and propaganda surfaced in the United States. An example of this was the was the so-called Jap hunting license, a fake official document and button that purported to authorize open season on hunting Japanese. Some reminded holders that there was no limit on the number of Japs that they might, that they could hunt or trap or otherwise exterminate. These licenses often characterize Japanese people as subhuman. Also shown is a photo of a woman carrying a white child. I came across this on eBay and it truly numbed me to my core. I have chosen to use it in this presentation because it is the absolute example of the casual racism from everyday white folk that much of, I'm sorry. Judy, we understand, please take your time. We so appreciate your making this presentation. That much of my work focuses on. The, the writing on the back reveals the disdain the writer held for Mary, who was obviously viewed as the stereotype of a mammy, a faithful worker who had great love for her white family. Focusing on the counter, I placed three vintage style restaurant daughter cups and saucers with the text white only floating at the surface of brown tinted resin simulating coffee. I also included white colored ketchup, napkin holder, salt and pepper shakers, a vinegar bottle, as well as a generic menu for the all white cafe. And in case you're curious, this work does recognize and reference the lunch counter civil rights protests of the 1960s. This is how the work was installed on location in 2006. This is a view as it was set up for a group exhibition in 2019 at the Museum of Anthropology in Vancouver. And this is another view. The process of collecting all of these items locally and on eBay also pointed me into the direction of collecting vintage photos of whites dressed as Indians. I had come across a photo of a father and child playing Indian, and I thought it was an anomaly. As I searched for more images, I seemed to learn more about the idiosyncrasies of white people, where there appears to be a widespread fascination of the idea of Indianness and their fantasies of being Indian themselves. Different from the public minstrel performances, these were homespun. I started isolating them from their backgrounds and I've used them in digital collages as well as decals fired into, into ceramic pieces. As a lark, I made this group of coffee mugs to display and sell at a local Aboriginal Christmas arts and crafts fair in Vancouver. Um, the buyers were indigenous and they had fun with the humor. On the lower right is actually um, Norman Rockwell as Indian. 
I found that too on eBay. The photos in, also inspired me to make a few figural works depicting whites in costume mode. Created, I created this work in 2009 and I did an updated version in 2022. The title is The American Family and focuses on several issues. One is how whites use culture as Halloween costumes. Another is the blackface mask that is a representation of the black male as brute. Then we have the Native American as child splayed out on the knees of the great white father. Next to him is the Asian female portrayed as subservient to her husband. The update is an apparent love and seemingly widespread use of assault rifles along with the support of the NRA for guns, guns, and more guns. In conclusion, the artistic journey that I've been on for the past 30 years plus has indeed, has indeed been an interesting one. Um, I hope it helps to expand the discourse um, within First Nations ceramic art. Also with regards to the other members in this panel, I wanna say it's nice being in, in the company of so many who are not only questioning, but flipping the virtuous and epic white script we've all been fed. That's it. <laughs> Thanks so much, Judy. I so adore those figures that you showed at the end. <laughs> Um, we have some really great questions um, that have come through, and I just want to thank all the speakers. I know we were all um, racing with time and thinking about this, and we could have gone on for a lot longer, each one of us, but I think we've given a really great overview. Um, I wanted to answer Lori's question that came in early about who is buying these um, contemporary commemorative plates. and. I have to say that most of them are going to museums who are using them to activate their collections and um, audiences by uh, comparing a contemporary view to a historic piece. And the second part of that would be that people are collecting these plates the way they, um, plates and figurines, um, the way they collected commemoratives. They just happen to be in a different kind of price point and rarity since most of them are you know for the most part unique or in series that are less than 10. So um, we have sold a number of groupings like the one behind my head would be most likely um, sold as a trio or um, some group because they're stronger as a set and Paul's work often goes in compositions like the entire Shiprock um, group is about four plates and they're all, um, it's, it's wonderful to see them entering private collections, but actually most of them are going to museum collections. Um, then Richard came up with a question about the process um, for ceramics and transfers, and that's a very long answer. And Paul wrote an entire book about it, which um, is called Ceramics in Print. Um, and yes, um, the kiln is involved. And I wanted to uh, maybe have Jacqueline speak a minute about uh, her process because she came to it from a non-maker's point of view whereas Paul came to it as a maker who then explored many different types of um, printing processes before he landed on where he is today. Jacqueline, can you unmute and maybe speak a moment about how you- I think I'm unmuted. I want to, I want to start off by saying thanks to all the, the participants who spoke. It was really great to hear the different um, points of view. Um, I was especially moved by you, Judy. Um, it's 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 rough, you know. Um, I also just need to say that I actually was in the hospital, <laughs> so I'm laying down a little bit. Um, so I hope you don't feel like I'm being disrespectful or anything. We're um, so grateful that you were able to join us and that you made such an effort to do so, Jacqueline. Thank you. Yeah. So I just want to say that um, I came to ceramics from background of painting and collage and um, textile work. And so um, 
when I started um, uh, doing the, the first series um, of uh, ceramics history at the dinner table, um, the, what I did was I made the collages, um, pulling out different illustrations and images of the stories that I wanted to tell and putting them together. And then the work was going to be shown, oh, I just keeps doing this. The work was going to be shown at the Ceramics Biennial. And I was able to be put in touch with a wonderful young woman, Emma, who is a, a ceramicist by practice. And um, together we worked on her um, putting my images onto the plates. Um, and all of that is detailed quite wonderfully, I think, in the film that the British Art Society made. Um, so in so many ways, I feel like it's almost a collaborative process in getting those works done. Thank you. Um, I think the other part of that question was about removing sections. Um, and Elizabeth, since so much of your work is about erasing and removing, could you answer a little mm -hmm. bit about that? Sure. Um, so I came, I kind of have learned all sorts of different craft processes. Um, I was really involved in uh, glass work and learning how to shape and polish glass. And so when I wanted to start taking flowers out of porcelain, that's sort of where I went was my um, understanding of how glass works. And so, you know, I knew that I had to work in water and I use a, an air powered pneumatic um, just Dremel tool with a diamond bit and just grind all the material out. And so, you know, there are other processes, you know, you can water jet cut into the porcelain. You can, you know, I think people even laser cut porcelain. Um, there are other less aggressive processes, but for the purposes of what I'm doing and this removal, I really like that evidence of the kind of like chipping away at the surface and the, um, the textures that are created through grinding that material out. Um, and then to save the dust, I have to actually drain the water through a sieve, which I've been using like a cheese making um, sieve in order to keep the dust, you know, to separate out the dust. And then I have to let it dry for a number of weeks um, before I bottle it up. So um, it's a process a lot of artists use, um, but I kind of came at it in a less um, direct way. It's just sort of inventing based on past knowledge from other materials. Thank you. Um, and I love that you preserve those um, erase, eraser marks or eraser um, debris, because it, it, yeah, that, that's an important visual part, but it's also intellectually, you know, part of, um, how, how people perceive your work. Um, Richard, second question is a little complicated, but I wanted to answer it. Um, I think a lot of you must have seen the Ai Weiwei image of him dropping the Han Dynasty urn. So those urns were not very valued. They were historic, but not valued by Chinese people in China. And so much of um, Ai Weiwei's work brings value to um, unvalued objects, furniture, bicycles, backpacks. Um, and through by bringing that image to the world, suddenly the Han Dynasty vases became valuable again. So um, when we would exhibit at antique shows, often we would get questions about um, you know, the work. So it was very funny as when I first started doing these shows, I would bring the transferware to the antique dealers and they would be, oh, these things aren't worth anything. And you know, to them, antiques are valuable and the transfer plates are $30, you know, $10, $50, or in the case of the commemoratives, valueless or negative value. Um, but what we all saw in them were the value of what they were, the techniques, the um, challenges of technology that um, were in that time to produce things of this beauty and this fragility. And it was, um, I think all the artists 
look at those pieces in awe because it would be very difficult to today in your own studio replicate those processes. So I think, yes, there are mixed feelings about these objects that they exist and what they say, but there's also um, a value that we were all trying to give them as they conveyed these messages by the work that is being done by contemporary artists. So I don't know if any of you want to um, directly answer that question, but um, since it, there were three of you are actually repurposing old materials, Elizabeth, Nikki, and Paul, and Paul's not here. Um, Jacqueline's creating new works. And um, so I, I don't know if there's a whole lot more to say about that, but Nikki, did you wanna sort of say anything? Well, I mean, the question itself implies that there's some sort of malice or disdain coming from the, um, the artist in, in the way that we're approaching the material. Um, and I think that there's a higher level of curiosity um, and, and like interplay that ends up happening when you commit to editing, um, editing these, these objects. But then also, you know, like for my piece, um, I'm inserting a woman who looks like me at a really uh, pivotal point in my own development into a narrative by, you know, out of the Rockwell plates, which you just simply didn't see images like that in his work. However, his work um, was something that, you know, shaped, I think, you know, had a way of shaping everyone a bit. I mean, there are such popular images. Um, and so I think um, also to get to circle back, because I believe this question came in um, during my presentation or right after. Um, I think that um, when I read this, I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, when I, when there, there definitely was part of looking at the plates in the store and being like, woohoo, yay. You know, these narratives are not something that people are holding on to because oftentimes when you think about families and how people interact, there's a lot more variety today, a variety of people, variety of roles. You know, this is a very traditional sort of format that the advertisers wanted to uh, use to sell products back in the day. Um, so in a way, to me, it was a point of expanse. And, um, and so I wanted to continue to expand that narrative. Um, uh, and, and the moment in which it happened just happened to be the 2016 presidential election. I mean, it was kind of like an instant in which the vision happened. And then from there, there was a period of unpacking, right? Unpacking meaning, unpacking uh, Rockwell and understanding him better as an artist. Um, and, uh, and, you know, it, there's a whole conversation around licensing and how that worked with the, with the um, plate companies, which um, we could get into, but, um, but yeah, you know, the type of rights he had were very different than the type of rights modern day artists have in controlling their images and how they're used. So, I mean, there, you know, is kind of like a hanging question mark as to, you know, if he had retained the rights to the plates, would he have created these on his own and at that point in time, right? Well, we don't know because he didn't have, he didn't retain the rights. Thank you, Nikki. Um, there's a wonderful question that it's, I think, um, you know, sort of point, uh, pointed at what Robin asks. And um, Robin, would you like to, are you able to see this question? It's, um, I'd like to return to Robin's end slide, her question of whose responsibility is it to re-steer cultural imagery and how reclaiming images and recontextualizing them may have a further reach beyond cultural institutions. Now, I, I made that the end slide because I wanted this question out in the world, you know, to artists and editors and um, people who buy these objects. So it really goes out to everyone as a, as a, a pause, a thought um, moving forward. Well, I think this, um, this exhibition, the beautiful catalog, all of the 
um, the videos, the conversations, the interviews, and what we're going to hear tomorrow is all part of that. I'll just mention that, um, you know, in relation to uh, the question that came up about uh, Nikki's work uh, in terms of Norman Rockwell's, um, the images that appeared on uh, collectible plates, our director, Lori Norton Moffat, has a lot of background in this. Um, you know, as she was coming up at the museum, collectibles were, you know, very significant uh, for Rockwell as a means of, um, you know, earning uh, income. But Lori, I don't know whether you'd like to be elevated to respond. Um, you've got some great comments in the chat there. This has just been so fascinating. And what I really appreciate that each of you, each of you brought into focus is this generational pers perspective of the now and how each of you is experiencing this work. And parallel with that are the copyright laws and the, the um, how shall I say, the impact of commerce. You know, these companies that were working to make these plates, they just wanted to make money. So they worked with the images that were free and the images that were free were the very early Rockwell works that preceded the, um, you know, current uh, works protected under copyright. So for a long time, these were pre-1923 images. And Nikki, I just absolutely love what you have done with your work and bringing a contemporary female perspective to it. And it's so fascinating to contrast that with you know, works a hundred years ago, but also that insidious influence of commerce back then and now, because yeah. the plate manufacturers in the 1970s and 80s, they were just working to make money and they were selling this idea of these limited edition images and choosing images that they could use for free, where yeah. they didn't have to pay the publisher, they didn't have to pay the artist. So the work that you've selected for your contemporary work was already pre-shaped by commerce laid over the artist's work mm -hmm. in order to maximize profits for the company. So I think that's an aspect of the story that is important to tell. Mm -hmm. And you've helped reveal it in an absolutely fascinating way. And I just so appreciate all the commentary of all of you because it just, it adds dimension to the Rockwell story and also the story of representation that we're talking about here. So thank you all. Thank you, <laughs> that was great. I think when we started, we were a little worried about whether um, Nikki's uh, work would resonate with Stephanie and Lori. So I'm glad to to see this openness to um, this other side. That you know, and it, it's not to deny the fact that many people have used Norman Rockwell's um, work as a starting point for um, social commentary. Uh, so. I think that's a great part of what has happened at the uh, Norman Rockwell Museum since its founding is to unpack, you know, the, the meaning of his work and also the real Norman Rockwell behind it, who was not necessarily mm -hmm. the person who was represented by the artwork on those plates. But, you know, I think that the, the freshness of all of your conversations is this notion of rethinking images that have been popular uh, at other points in history and um, to bring um, a, a new understanding of the way that they have impacted us and to transform them in your own way. And you've all done that so beautifully. There's a question here for um, Judy from Ayana. Uh, and the question is in uh, your research, Judy, um, you know, did you know the context of the Norman Rockwell as an Indian, did you did you realize that that was him when you first picked that up? Yes, because there was a little magazine, a uh, little newspaper clipping attached to the back of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
So uh, just to provide a little context, um, Rockwell would sometimes do um, illustrations in which he would serve as his own model. And um, he at the time was working on a historical piece about um, Stockbridge and the, um, the founders of our town who were Native American and um, who unfortunately were dispelled from their land. But um, that's, that was the context in which that was created. That's fascinating. So it's quite ironic in a way. Well, it made it onto a mug. It made it onto a mug. <laughs> with, with a Mr. T saying. <laughs> um, I think we're kind of wrapped up with the questions in the Q and A's. Yes. And I just want to say thank you and Robin for including this work in the show. It's meant so much to us and I've learned so much. And without these, kind of crossovers into different fields, you know, you kind of speak to the same audience over and over again. So this is an enormous opportunity for both our, um, our gallery program and the artists um, work that's being seen this way. So I truly appreciate it. And I can't wait to reflect upon this a few years from now and see mm -hmm. what doors have been opened. So um, thank you. Thank you, Leslie. You learned so thank much you. along the way. So you can't um, discount how much um, knowledge is being shared through this, uh, just even this evening. Mm -hmm. So um, good luck with thank everything you. tomorrow. We'll be watching from home and relaxing this time. <laughs> well, we appreciate all the inspiration and the inspiration of our panelists tonight. You are all um, just exceptional and we've been so honored to have you. Um, thank you everybody for listening and uh, we will look forward hopefully to seeing you tomorrow starting at 10 o'clock our symposium uh, continues and we'll uh, go through uh, another series of really interesting presentations um, that will end at 5 p.m. So thank you again from all of us at the Norman Rockwell Museum and the Rockwell Center and we'll see you soon. Bye. Thank you. Have Bye. a great evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. So much. <laughs>